Thank you, Bill. It's uh, wonderful to uh, be with all of you. Uh, Bill mentioned that we've been uh, good friends for over 40 years. Uh, but actually, our family history goes back even farther than that. Bill was a high school classmate and good friend of my uh, brother-in-law, Gary. Uh, Gary, Joe, and Bill went to Lowell High School. I think it was 50 years ago. You can't be that old. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> well, you're looking well. <laughs> Um, it would have been a special treat also to be introduced by, by my good friend, uh, Justice Carol Corrigan. We've also been good friends for over uh, 25 years, but recently our friendship has been tested. She introduced me to golf. <laughs> I'm living proof that you're never too old to learn something stupid. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Golden Gate University for its kind invitation to deliver the Chief Justice uh, Ron George uh, lecture. Maybe you would get more people here if you didn't call it a lecture. I am not going to lecture you. We're going to have a conversation. Um, I had the distinct honor and singular privilege of serving on the Supreme Court for every day, every day of Ron George's exemplary tenure as Chief Justice of California. I also ran on the same retention ballot with Ron George in 1998. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, Ron and I were challenged because of an opinion that he wrote and I signed. Um, on the recommendation of Governor Wilson, we both formed uh, retention campaign committees. Uh, we both raised almost a million dollars. Um, when the chief retired in 2010, I was on the retention ballot by myself. I must tell you, frankly, it was a lot easier to run without him. <laughs> and I've told Ron that myself. Now, Ron is widely known for his uh, wonderful sense of humor, um, and he pulled it on me the first day I was on the court. Um, we were in Sacramento in our uh, Supreme Court room, and Ron was in an associate justice, and he was seated right next to me, so he entered the courtroom right next to me. So he turns around, and he says, Ming, we have a job for you. When you get in the courtroom, you're to find the missing rosette in the ceiling. Well, I spent the entire oral argument looking at the ceiling, and I'm sure everyone in the audience thought I was seeking divine guidance <laughs> to make my decision. Well, as it turns out, and you can't tell anybody this because I'm going to pull this on Goodwin Lou. <laughs> there is a large chandelier in the middle of the courtroom. You cannot see the missing rosette from the seat of the junior justice. Don't tell anybody that. Uh, we have oral argument, and uh, we finish at about noon. Uh, we then go into conference. We conference on all of those cases that we argued that morning. It gets to be about 1.20, and we're still in conference. I said, lunch? Uh, picture this, seven California Supreme Court justices having lunch at the hot dog stand out in front of the Supreme Court. So I turned to Ron, and I said, I thought you told me this was a promotion. <laughs> so my contribution to the court is that we now get to have lunch served when we are conferencing. What a novel idea. Feed these people. They will be friendlier. <laughs> well, uh, one day, uh, all of us uh, come in after oral argument, and each of us have our lunches um, out on the table. And mine is a brown paper bag. And I look in the bag, and there is a pickled pig's foot. I didn't order this. <laughs> Ron looks at me with that sheepish grin and said, Ming, would you like your real lunch? <laughs> so I had a wonderful time uh, serving with Ron George on the Supreme Court. Um, this evening, I'm going to share with you some of my experiences as a Army captain. I'm going to discuss the importance of 
the right to freedom of speech, uh, particularly during times of war. And finally, I'm going to make some observations about the very poor treatment our veterans have received. Now, coincidentally, November 11th is Veterans Day. On that day, 94 years ago, World War I ended. It was supposed to be the war to end all wars, and we know what happened after that. Each year since 1919, at the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, our nation pauses to pay tribute to its veterans and to honor their service and their sacrifice. Because of their commitment to duty, honor, and country, we live today in the most prosperous and the freest country in the history of the world. The freedom we enjoy today was made possible by the sacrifice and courage of thousands of veterans. Members of the legal profession have a unique and special responsibility both to defend the Constitution during times of war and a similar responsibility to ensure that those who served in those wars are cared for and protected. In 1967, when I graduated from law school, that service and that sacrifice was brought home to me in graphic terms. I was eager to begin my legal career, but I knew that the practice of law would have to wait. A war was being waged halfway around the world. The U.S. Army and President Johnson insisted that I show up. And frankly, it never occurred to me to say no. My parents had two sons in the Army at the same time. Instead of donning the well-tailed suit of a trial lawyer, I found myself wearing jungle fatigues in the jungles of Vietnam. Interestingly enough, there is a rule, at least there was back then, I'm not sure that it still exists, but only one sibling could be sent to a war zone at the same time. I have never, I've never let my brother Tom forget that. I've also never forgotten landing on the airstrip in Quang Tri. I was in a C-130 cargo plane with a tank in the center of the plane with my personnel on both sides. As the plane descended, the captain announced, the airstrip is under attack. When we land, you are to offload smartly to the rear of the plane, and we will take off. I thought to myself, thanks for the ride. That was the beginning of a year-long experience of which I seldom speak, but will never forget. I learned from firsthand experience what duty, honor, country, and leadership were all about. I was assigned to the 1st Brigade of the 5th Mechanized Infantry Division. We were deployed as a unit from Fort Carson, Colorado to Quang Tri, Vietnam to replace the 3rd Marine Division. I gained newfound respect for the military precision and logistics. We moved 5,000 men and all of our equipment, including 2,000 vehicles, from Fort Carson, Colorado to Quang Tri, Vietnam, and were combat operational within five days. In civilian life, I would still be looking for my toothbrush. <laughs> I lived in a tent for six months. I have not been camping since. <laughs> in the corner of my garage at home is an old army foot locker, locker filled with memories. In 1969, when I returned home, I sent that foot locker ahead with all of my worldly possessions. I, my son Jason, my daughter Jennifer are here tonight, and I'm sure they're saying there is no way you could fit all of your possessions in one foot locker. But that was true back then. When I opened that foot locker the other day, the memories of the war flooded back. I remembered the family I left behind. I remembered the burden 
of my Army service was much more difficult on my family and my parents than it was on me. As Bill mentioned, my parents were Chinese immigrant farmers. My father, father actually immigrated in 1913. He came without family, without funds, without language. And yet, in this wonderful land of hope and opportunity, he was able to carve out a remarkable life for his family. As Bill said, I am the youngest of eight children. My brothers and sisters' names are Mary, George, Joe, Betty, Jack, Jeannie, and Tom. I have no idea where Ming came from. <laughs> My father was a tough, hardworking, very pragmatic man. He lived through the extreme racial prejudice of the anti-Chinese days. He lived through the Great Depression. He was not an emotional man. I had never seen him cry. Before my deployment to Vietnam, I made one final trip home to say goodbye. On the last day, my parents took me to the airport. Before boarding the plane, I gave mom a big hug. I reached out to shake dad's hand. He brushed his side, gave me a warm embrace. When I pulled away, there were tears streaming down his face. Much more difficult on my parents than on me. Shortly after I returned home, my father suffered a paralyzing stroke. He never spoke again. He never walked again. Much more difficult on my parents than on me. As I continued to sift through those mementos in that footlocker, I also remembered the brave men with whom I had the privilege and the honor of serving. Outstanding young men from every part of the country of every race, every color, every creed, who didn't care about the color of your skin. They just wanted to know if you, could be, if you could be counted on when the going got tough. Lifelong relationships were forged out of sometimes terrifying and harsh circumstances. Unfortunately, many of my friends did not return home. Although the Vietnam War's objectives were unclear, one result is painfully clear. Thousands of brave men and women died. Many more were wounded or traumatized by the experience of war. The day that each of us returned home from Vietnam is a day that is etched in my memory. I can still hear the exhilarating war of happy soldiers as our plane touched down on American soil. Friends and family welcomed us home with open arms and tears of joy. Across the country, there were countless random acts of kindness. Many civilians expressed their appreciation for our sacrifices. Some people forfeited their plane tickets so that soldiers could get seats on full flights. Others turned their cars around to offer rides to soldiers who were traveling in the other direction. Some bought dinners for soldiers as a token of their gratitude. And yet the homecoming for too many veterans was needlessly traumatic. We left Vietnam wearing the uniforms with pride. However, when we returned as veterans, our uniform too often became a target for demonstrators. Many protesters were unable to see that veterans were men who endured terror and tragedy beyond words in service of their country. And the personal attacks on veterans only caused them additional injury. The Vietnam War was America's longest, and it ended abruptly. There was no official welcome home. There, was no, there were no parades. There was not even a simple thank you for serving. The Vietnam Memorial is the nation capital, in the nation's capital 
honors veterans for their service to their country in an unpopular war. Initially, the memorial itself was no less controversial than the war that spawned it. Before the wall was built, it, it had many detractors. It was even called the Black Dash of Fame. However, once the wall was completed, it seemed to give voice to deep and complex feelings caused by the war, and it offered our nation an opportunity to heal. In 1972, seven years after the war ended, 15,000 veterans marched in a long overdue welcome home parade. A few days later, 150,000 veterans and their families gathered in D.C. to dedicate the Vietnam Memorial. For many, the wall allowed them to say goodbye to those they left behind. They were able to touch the names of those who were lost and remembered their sacrifices. But when the memorial was erected, a wrong was at long last made right, and those who fought and died were no longer forgotten. The wall was and is a different kind of memorial. When you walk down into it, the darkness envelops you. In the midst of the darkness are the names of those who died. Although the names are forever memorialized in darkness, you then get to leave and walk up into the light. It is a place where the living can confront the darkness of death and embrace the light of life. It is a place of personal reflection. It engages your senses and your emotions. It does not leave you unchanged. It became a catalyst for healing the nation. My visits to the memorial are always emotional. But for me, the real poignance of the memorial is that as I reach out to touch the names of good friends, I remember their courage, their bravery, their commitment to country. And then I see my face reflected in the black granite and I realize how lucky I am to be here. If my name were on the wall, I never would have met my wonderful and dear wife, Carol. On December 19th of next month, we will have been married 42 years. I would never have had Jennifer and Jason, two talented and terrific children. I am very proud that both of my children are lawyers and that they have both chosen public service careers. Jennifer is in the general counsel's office of the University of California, specializing in employment law. Jason is a deputy district attorney in Alameda County, where he heads the DNA cold hit section. I suppose it's just a coincidence that I authored two Rudder Group practice guides, one in employment law, and the other in DNA forensics. <laughs> Some people will do anything to help their children. <laughs> Jennifer and Jason have charming and loving spouses, Michael and Elizabeth. They have given us three wonderful grandchildren, McKinney, McKenna, Sydney, and Nolan Ming. And finally, if not my name were on that wall, I realized that I would never have the privilege and honor of serving as a judge in California for the last 25 years. There is no doubt about it. I have the privilege of living the American dream. Because I have been so blessed, I feel a special responsibility to the 58,000 men and women who did not return home. I feel a special responsibility to contribute to my community. Let us never forget them. Let us never forget the ultimate price they paid for our liberty. Let us remember the unfilled promise in their lives that now will never come to pass. And let us create communities and a nation that would be worthy of their sacrifice. 
let us keep the American dream alive for all of us. Now, this American dream of ours was born of the marriage of two important historical documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The first was written in 1776 while we were at war with England. The second was written in 1787 after we started building the institutions of government that would make this wonderful idea of democracy work. The language of the two documents is really very different. The Declaration gave us the sobering rhetoric of war, the passion to pursue excellence and perfection. The Constitution has less passion, less certainty. There is no reference to the Creator. The Constitution gave us the dry discourse of governments, the structure, if you would, would for this wonderful roadmap for a working democracy. The Declaration was the promise, the Constitution was the fulfillment. The Declaration gave voice to high ideals. The Constitution put those, those ideals into practice. But both, both have as their purpose the protection of our freedom, the protection of our liberty. And our allegiance to those principles is the foundation of our nation. And it is that foundation that enriches all of us. In 1919, when President Wilson first set aside November 11th to honor our veterans, he said we should look back with pride at, quote, the heroism of those who died in the country's service with gratitude for their victory because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the councils of nations. The selfless sacrifice of our veterans makes our freedom and liberty possible. As members of the legal profession, we have a unique responsibility for defending that freedom, even in the time of war. To illustrate the point, I would like you to travel with me in a time capsule. It's October of 1919. The United States Supreme Court is about to hear the case of Abrams versus the United States. The five defendants in the case are Russian immigrants arrested for throwing leaflets from the rooftop of a building in New York City. Leaflets that criticized the U.S. involvement in World War I and advocated a strike on munition production. The de defendants had already been convicted, sentenced to 20 years in prison under the Espionage Act. The act made it illegal to use any false, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language against the government. Sound a little broad? Well, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes listens to the uh, defendants' arguments that the conviction should be overturned because free speech should be absolute, regardless of, of its potential danger. Sound a little outrageous? The government argues that any criticism of government may be criminalized during time of war, even if it is unlikely that the views expressed to it will impede the war effort. So you have two extremes argued. The majority of the court affirms the convictions as they have in previous cases involving the same statute. Justice Holm disagrees with both sides. He says the First Amendment protection of free speech is not absolute. The government can't not, cannot suppress speech that, he, that it thinks is dangerous unless the threat of such speech is imminent. Holmes believes that because defendants' protest was unlikely to achieve its end, he even called this protest silly. He said these silly pamphlets, I think it's quote in his dissent, reads the silly pamphlets by unknown individuals could hardly be threatening. But this represents a change in Justice Holmes' view. Just a few months earlier, Holmes had written for a unanimous court upholding the conviction of two socialists for attempting to distribute thousands of flyers to American servicemen recently drafted to fight in World War I. The flyers criticized the war effort, urged draftees to resist the draft. In that decision, Holmes 
wrote that criticizing the war, war was likely to, was like shouting fire in a theater, causing panic. When the nation is at war, many things that might be said in times of peace are such a hindrance that their effort and their utterance may uh, not be endured as long as men are fighting. Why did he change his mind? His colleagues were so bewildered when he changed his mind in Abrams that he, they, they made a visit at, at his home trying to persuade him. They said, the country is in turmoil. The justices pleaded that the court should speak with one voice. The war had indeed ended. The race riots and labor strikes had spread across the country. Anarchists had mailed booby traps in brown paper packages to politicians and judges, including one to Justice Holmes. Fortunately, that package was intercepted before it was delivered. In times of war, it is all too tempting to take liberty for granted. Now, Justice Holmes was no stranger to war. When he was a 20-year-old senior at Harvard, he enlisted in the Union Army during the Civil War. He was wounded three times in that war, uh, suffering a near, uh, near uh, fatal wounds in his neck and chest. Now, um, as a young captain, he was on the front line in the Battle of Fort Stevens. President Lincoln made a visit. The president stood up, not realizing that he was making himself a target. Holmes yelled, get down, you damn fool. Before the president left the fort, he sought out Holmes and said, I'm sure glad you know how to talk to a civilian. In the years after the war, at a Memorial Day address, Justice Holmes said, quote, this day is the most sacred day of the year. War, he explained, teaches that our snug, oversafe corner of the world is no eternal necessity, mere, but merely a mere calm in the midst of the storm, and we must always be ready for danger. Freedom, he reminds us, is not our birthright. We cannot treat it lightly. It sometimes demands sacrifice. As Justice Eisenhower would say years later, history does not entrust the care of freedom to the weak and the timid. Now, Holmes's view of the First Amendment did not prevail in 1919, but his dissenting opinion eventually became the clear and present danger standard that we are all familiar with. As members of the legal profession, we have a unique responsibility to defend not just our constitutional rights and the rule of law, but I submit to you that we also have the responsibility to care for those who serve during times of war. I greatly respect the distinguished panel that has been assembled to discuss these issues. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about the rights of veterans. Last week, I met with two veterans who are now law students. Both left the service with disability claims that took years to resolve and in one case is not yet resolved. Eric Christensen and Kevin McCarthy are here tonight. Both Kevin and Eric have been working diligently to assist other veterans in their reentry to society. They want a dedicated veterans court in San Francisco to match the resources um, uh, with the needs of veterans throughout the city. As of today, only the needs of veterans residing in the Tenderloin are served, and they're served only by the homeless court. I understand there is a, a panel tomorrow with the presiding judge of the San Francisco Superior Court. I hope you will raise with her the need for a dedicated veterans court. I urge all of you to 
step up and assist veterans in securing their rights and benefits. Let us, them, let us help them secure the resources that they need and the benefits they deserve. I told Eric and Kevin that we need more lawyers to follow the outstanding example of Gordon S. Palmer in standing up for vets. Now, I just met Gordy this evening, and we had a chat over at the reception. We had another chance to chat while I was, uh, while we were preparing for these uh, remarks. There was a recent article written in the Bar Journal about Gordy, and his former managing partner at Morrison Forrester, Keith Wetmore, is quoted as saying, and I quote, Gordy is a scorched earth trial lawyer. He is dogged, and that doggedness is fueled, fueled by the courage of his conviction to veterans. In the case of Cashman versus Shinseki, it took Gordon 10 years to resolve. Mr. Cashman said, quote, Gordy is the only reason I won, because he didn't give up. But how many veterans have an attorney like Gordy. When I met Gordy this evening, he told me about a, a veteran in San Diego that was swept up off by the in the streets of San Diego by a stranger, taken home, called Gordy for his help, and Gordy helped the um, individual get his veterans' rights. In the a landmark decision that uh, Gordy uh, handled uh, in Cushman, it was the first time a court ruled that veterans who apply for benefits have due process rights. I ask all of you to stand up with Gordy and Eric and Kevin and offer your assistance to our distinguished veterans who have served and sacrificed. Join these dedicated attorneys to ensure that our promises to our veterans are kept. Now, I would have been delighted to participate in the conversation with Gordy, with uh, Judge McFetridge of the San Francisco Superior Court and Judge Harry Wingate of the U.S. District Court from the Southern District of Mississippi. And I apologize that a family emergency now makes that impossible. I'm now going to utter the two most important words in any speech. In conclusion, after World War II, the great General Omar Bradley, while serving as an administrator of the Veterans Administration, had this to say about freedom. Quote, no word was ever spoken that held out more hope, demanded greater sacrifice, needed to be nurtured, blessed more the giver, cursed more its destroyer, or came closer to God's will on earth. That is worth fighting for. About 60 years earlier, on Memorial Day, 1886, Justice Holmes said this, to fight out a war or to carry out anything else to an ending worth reaching, you must believe in something with all your might. More than that, you must be willing to commit yourself to a course without being able to foresee exactly where it will come out. That is, all that is required is that you try as hard as you can. The rest is fate. To all of you here tonight, and especially to those of you who hope someday to be members of the legal profession, I urge you to believe in the principles of the Constitution with all of your might, to commit yourself to freedom and the rule of law with all of your might, and to try as hard as you can to improve this wonderful legal system of ours. I think it is the best legal system in the world, even with all of its flaws. So let us face the challenge of our time with the same conviction, courage, and resolve that those who have gone before us have, 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 led, have led the way. Let us fulfill the plea of Abraham Lincoln as he stood upon the battlefield at Gettysburg exactly 100 
50 years ago. Let us resolve to honor our dead, that our honored dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justice Chen. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Gordon Erspemer, who will engage in a discussion with Judges McFetridge and Wingate. Mr. Erspemer, or Gordy, as he is known to his colleagues, is a retired partner at Morrison and & Forrester and a fierce veterans advocate. Throughout his highly successful and extensive career as a partner and senior counsel with Morrison & Forrester from 1982 to 2012, Gordy has carried on an active pro bono practice representing disabled veterans and veterans groups. He served as a board member for the advocacy group Swords to Plowshares for several years and has been honored by numerous organizations for his exemplary advocacy on behalf of veterans. Among the many who have recognized his work on behalf of veterans are the America Bar Association, Vietnam Veterans of America, Swords to Plowshares, and both the California Lawyer and American Lawyer magazines. It is my great pleasure to introduce Gordon Erspermer. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, in listening to Justice Chin, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of something that I felt many times in my life, which is the real power of individuals to accomplish change in our society and how important it is that people who have feelings and inform principles early in their life carry through the rest of their lives and try to establish uh, the means by which those, those principles can be realized. I am very happy to, this evening to be moderating a panel composed of two individuals who served our nation in the military and have later become judges after going through uh, other parts of our legal system and I think provide a unique perspective on the value of the military training and the, mil and the perspective in uh, serving as judges in, in our judicial system and they come from two different parts of the country and they come one from the state system and one from the federal system and I, I'm not going to read their resumes but I'm going to want to briefly introduce them to you and then we can get started with the panel. Uh, on my far right is, is, is Judge James McKittredge. I'm sorry, McFedridge, I'm sorry. I do know McKittredge too, that's my problem. He, he is he's currently a Superior Court Justice in, in the Sacramento County, uh, formerly was a, a Lieutenant in the U.S. Navy JAG Corps now retired, uh, went to Santa Clara University, uh, served in private practice, Roper's Majesty, the Deputy AG, but perhaps most important, uh, served in Operation Iraqi Freedom and served in the military in Baghdad. And has continued uh, to, to serve in various capacities associated with the military ever since. Our second panelist, who comes from the great state of Mississippi uh, and traveled a long way, is District Judge, U.S. District Judge uh, Henry Wingate. He is a, also a former member of the U.S. J Corps and told me earlier this evening that you were the first African American J Corps uh, uh, person ever. ever. Is it, was that, did I get that right? I think I did. Anyway, uh, he's been an attorney and a judge for many, many years. Uh, he went to Grinnell College, actually where my younger brother went to, uh, by the way. Uh, he re received his uh, law degree from Yale Law School. Uh, he also served as the attorney, att attorney general in the state of Mississippi and in the, I believe, in the U.S. Attorney's Office as well. 
so he, he brings a, a, a long uh, period of experience as a federal court judge to us, uh, almost 30 years as a federal judge, and he's seen probably just about everything in his courtroom, I'm sure, over, the, over that time. So what, what we're, we hope to focus on is uh, what the, the intersection means of the being a member of the military and being a judge and what that brings to uh, uh, your, your ability to act as a judge and, and act fairly and, and, and conduct business. So I'd, I would ask, maybe start, I'm, I'm going to take, the, take the, uh, the mic and bring it over and we can have a discussion about these topics. But I, 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 I'd like each of you, if you could, to in turn uh, talk a little bit about how you got into the military and then how you got into the, uh, how you became a judge and perhaps a little bit about how your um, experiences as a, as a, as a, in the military shaped your, your vision and your, your, the way you conduct business as a judge. Sure. Um, I, I uh, good evening everybody. I think we're, we're mic'd up here, so I think, oh, we are I think, up here. I think we're, we're good to go. Um, Can everybody hear? <laughs> I was uh, in the Navy JAG Corps right out of law school. I graduated from USF Law School, took the bar exam, and once I passed the bar, I got my orders and went to Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, ha had the honor of serving in the Navy for three and a half years. I was in, in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba for, for 22 months, and I was in Norfolk, Virginia for the rest of my time uh, doing mostly court-martial cases. And I, I guess, uh, one thing the military has done in terms of, of shaping my outlook or my career is I, I really missed uh, being out of the Navy once I got out. I was in the reserves for a while, but I was working for a law firm, and the pressures of working for a law firm didn't exactly match uh, what doing the reserves, so I got out of the reserves, but I, I, I kept in touch with my Navy friends, and I, I never lost that desire to somehow get back in and it just seemed, especially when I moved to Sacramento away from any kind of naval base that that was really going to be something that wasn't going to happen. But as, as fate would have it, I, I, uh, when I was with the Attorney General's office, I, one of my colleagues in the office uh, was an Army Reserve Colonel and she knew of actually a Superior Court judge in Sacramento, Morrison England, who's now on the federal bench. Uh, who was actually seeking out uh, judge advocates to, to come in to the Army Reserve. So I, I interviewed with him and, and got back into it. Uh, and this was before, uh, before the thing started happening after September 11th. Uh, it's a long story, but I, I actually didn't go in the Reserves. I went in the National Guard, and I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the National Guard now. Uh, but I, I always uh, just in, enjoyed uh, from that very first experience being in the Navy, working in the military, uh, uh, that, that perspective. And, and as far as how it influences me as a, as a judge, I'm an active user of PowerPoint in the, uh, in the courtroom. And one of my slides uh, shows a, a picture of a beach in sand dunes. And, and I tell the jurors, you know, how many of you would rather be at the beach? And then the next slide is the famous shot from one of the, the landing craft on, on, uh, at Normandy. And you see the, the Army uh, troops who are leaving that, the safety of that, that landing craft and marching right into the bluffs of Omaha Beach. And if you've ever seen Saving Private Ryan, you know what, what, what that's all about. And I, uh, and I emphasize that the sacrifices that have been made to preserve our system uh, are something we all need to remember. And then the next slide I show is the definition of hardship. So I put them through sort of this, this civics lesson and then explain what hardships are. And I, I don't get that many hardships, uh, really. I, 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 think I, I think the impression on them works that jury service is a big part of, of, our, of our judicial branch. It cannot function without jurors who are willing to sacrifice and and to do their duties as, as, as jurors, even though they don't want to be there and they'd rather be at the beach. And so I, I try to emphasize that. I, I, I guess the other thing, too, um, uh, I, I, became a, I wanted to become a, a judge because I had the good fortune of working as a judicial extern for the Marin County Superior Court and also 
for the uh, for the federal uh, for Judge uh, Gene Lynch, who is a federal judge here in the Northern District, and I I never lost the desire to become a judge in in as a result of that, I thought what they did, what the judges I worked for did was the greatest thing you could do in the legal profession and it always stuck with me. So that's, to answer that part of it, uh, that's another, that's a reason why I, I became a judge. But I do try and integrate uh, the sacrifices that our veterans have made into the introduction and, and it never ceases to amaze me, especially having served in Kuwait and Iraq, um, I, I had a recent visit to Ni Nigeria with the National Guard. The system that we have, we take so much for granted, and it never amazes me that we to see 12 strangers come together in a courtroom and reach a result. Sometimes they don't always re reach a result, but it, it's amazing. They come from all walks of life. They hear the evidence. They decide the case in, in, the, in the deliberation room, and they all come out in agreement, either it's an acquittal or, or a guilty verdict, or if it's a civil case, uh, whatever the, the verdict form requires, at least nine of them answer yes or no to. And uh, if you really think about that and think about what else is out there in the world in terms of the other legal systems, it's, it's nothing short of amazing and I think even a little bit miraculous. So, Judge, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, that was enjoyable. <laughs> I'm Henry Wingate, and I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. My story is very different from the stories that you will hear from others, mainly because of where I came. Mississippi, when I went off to college, was segregated. And so then when I was in law school, we were just climbing out of segregation. Then I went to the military, to the Navy, and the Navy was still wrestling with matters of integration, segregation. I wanted to serve my country, so I applied for the JAG Corps. Didn't know what in the world it was. In fact, it's amazing to me now how I can mention JAG almost anywhere and everybody knows what it is. At one time it was, what in the world is that? But now it's a common name. So I wanted to serve my country. I also wanted to be a lawyer. So then I, I um, applied for the JAG Corps and I applied in Mississippi had an interesting experience. I went in and talked to the recruiter, told him I wanted to apply for the JAG Corps. He looked it up to see what it was. And then he promptly told me that this was a special program, that the Navy was going to select only 90 in the country for this particular program, because those selected would be allowed to go to law school and would be promoted while in law school and the time in law school would count towards retirement. Special program. Most um, recruits would uh, provide five points to a recruiter if enlisted, and maybe, I think, 10 points if an officer, but one who would be a successful JAG candidate would provide for the recruiter a whopping 25 points. And since the recruiter had to have 50 points at the end of the year, that was half of the requirement right there. So here I applied for the JAG Corps, and I was told immediately that I was not qualified. No question was asked to me about uh, where I attended, where I expected to attend law school, GPA, or anything else. I was simply told I wasn't qualified. So then I went back to Iowa while I was in college at Grinnell and decided I'd better apply there and hope that I wouldn't have the same experience I'd had the first time because that recruiter and I had had words after he had um, had some choice comments to me and I had some choice comments to him and unfortunate for myself, I had much too much hubris at the time because I had just taken a course in karate. <laughs> so I thought I could take anything and anybody out 
And so I had my little view of my uh, invincibility, and of course he had his, and so we didn't quite get along. So that, so that uh, session had not ended well. I went back to Iowa, and I thought I would be in much better company, so I applied there. I ran into the same difficulty. Uh, they told me that they didn't think I was qualified there either. However, when they asked me what law school I intended to attend, I dumped out a packet of acceptances on their desk, and they went through those acceptances, and somehow that impressed them with all those letters, and they decided that maybe they ought to interview me after all. Well, as it turns out, they made me the number one applicant from Iowa. And so then I ended up in this special program. I didn't know how special it was. I was glad I was in it. But then when I reported much later during the summer, I found out that the other 89 didn't look like me. <laughs> I was the only African American. And so then, after I completed law school, I went on active duty, and at that time was the only African American in the uh, Navy JAG Corps. That um, presented some problems because different jurisdictions wanted my precious body since they were having some racial issues. Um, Norfolk warned me because Norfolk had had more racial problems than anybody at that point. And so then I was assigned to Norfolk. San Diego wanted me. Great Lakes wanted me. Even Philippines, because they all had some racial problems during the time. The Navy did not release its racial problems. In fact, later on, when I was on active duty and I personally stopped three riots and expected to be commended and meddled for it, I was told that I could not be commended because my efforts were in a cause which was not identified by the Navy as having actually occurred. So then I could not get any um, recognition for those matters. Anyway, I served on active duty, and during that time period, I had some success in the courtroom. I tried more cases than anyone. I tried more general court martials than anyone on the East Coast. And I tried all the high profile stuff. So I had senior officials, senior officers, junior officers. I had all the high profile stuff. I had the espionage case that I had to gain a uh, top secret clearance in order to defend my client. I had um, the assault cases, the rape cases. I had the ships colliding. I had everything you could have. And so I went up and down the East Coast trying cases. So then, I had a tremendous experience there in the courtroom. I learned to navigate the courtroom. I learned something about the evidence. I learned the rigors of cross-examination. And I learned, most importantly, how valuable direct examination was because most folk tend to look at cross-exam as being the highlight of the courtroom, not recognizing that the one who is deft at direct examination allows his, her witness to make the big impact, the great credibility statement, and has far more impact in the final analysis than a few little points made on cross. So anyway, I learned all of that. And then, after I got out of the military, after I had hurdled some other difficulties, because, as I told you earlier, Mississippi was coming out of segregation and to some extent, so was the Navy. And unfortunately, Norfolk at the time had his problems. And so then I had some problems with the Admiral over five states, and I had some problems with the captain of the base. And they reported me, and I reported them. I did Article 129, and went to Admiral Zumwalt. And Admiral Zumwalt sent the Inspector General of the Navy down to Norfolk to make an investigation. And after all the dust cleared, the admiral was directed to resign within 30 days, and the captain of the base was placed under house arrest. And then people started speaking to me again. Well, anyway, the Navy rectified its problems. 
did a tremendous job on that, which is why I'm so committed to the Navy, because they recognized the problems that it had and made the correction. They then offered me duty station anywhere in the world that I wished, said name somewhere, take a dart and throw it at a map of the world and anywhere it hits, we'll send you to the nearest base. Then after that you go to the Pentagon and then after that you'll be commander of a base. So they gave me all that. My wife instead said, we're headed back to Mississippi. And then there was one other person who had a vote. There was my mother <laughs> and therefore, even though I voted against it, it was unanimous because <laughs> they didn't count my vote. And so then I went back to Mississippi. Eight years later, I was fortunate enough to be recommended for a federal judgeship. So I went home and eight years later, I was a federal judge. During those eight years, I integrated the Attorney General's office, I integrated the District Attorney's office, I integrated the U.S. Attorney's office, I integrated the local law school as a professor, and I did all those kinds of things. So then, that had been a mission of mine to dismantle those walls of segregation in my home state. Meanwhile, the Navy still had an interest in me, so while I was in the reserves, then they sent me to Annapolis, to investigate the double E exam scandal where I had to report to Congress on our findings. I served in that committee with a senator from Arizona named McCain and also with um, Lloyd Cutler at the time who was Bill Clinton's lawyer and I think two other people. They later asked me if I would serve on the Board of Governors for the Naval Academy. I then um, was asked to go and resolve a matter involving a $600 million cruiser where the contractor and the Navy had uh, odds with each other and I had to go and resolve that matter. Then they um, decided that I should report early for my active duty for training for two weeks because there was a capital murder case right here. It was from Treasure Island where two guys had kidnapped a wave brought her downtown San Francisco and killed her. The Navy wanted to handle that matter as a capital murder case and they wanted some JAGs to do it and have this matter prosecuted on the base. They had some sharp, well-experienced civilian lawyers representing the defendants and the Navy then decided that maybe they needed somebody with a bit more experience. So then they uh, turned the page and saw the town of Mississippi and decided that since I was doing capital murder cases when I was assistant district attorney, that it was time for me to do my two week active. So then they brought me up here <laughs> and gave me the assignment to take care of that matter. And when I finished, I could go home, but not until then. So I had not a two week active duty training, it, it was uh, active duty for training, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> well anyway, I came up here and then after the capital murder case was done and over, then I could go home. But the Navy has called upon me many times to do things. The Secretary of Navy has called upon me sometimes to do some things and so I'm still very much involved with the United States Navy. And what I have to say about the Navy is that it was a wonderful opportunity. I love the Navy, I love the military. Came close to making it a career, but as I said, I was outvoted by a major majority vote that became unanimous when they voted. And so then I ended up back in Mississippi. So then with regard to what I learned as a practitioner before the military court, just so many things. And I hope we can touch on some of those matters as we have these discussions here. But um, being in a courtroom on a day by day basis as I was, because when I went before the United States Senate, the um, Senate asked me about my prior experience. And I think it was a senator from Illinois who said, or either Strom Thurman, who said, we won't ask you about trial matters we see that you tried cases constantly in the military, constantly in the Attorney General's office, constantly in the District Attorney's office, constantly in the U.S. Attorney's office, 
we will not ask you one thing about the trial of cases. I had already said that while my age was young, because I was only 37, that my experience due to the Navy and all these other positions I had held was ancient. <laughs> I turn it over. Okay. I, 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 I don't know how much time we have left, but one of the topics that, that, I, that I thought might be of interest, particularly to, to the people attending tonight, what, was the topic of uh, how s people in active duty in the military are treated differently than our civilians for purposes of the Constitution. And may, maybe it'll, it'll be a gateway into some discussion tomorrow, because I know I want to speak a lot about, in the afternoon session, about uh, how vet veterans uh, do not share the civil rights of a lot of other Americans and how the institutional discrimination has come to exist in, in a system uh, of justice for, for, for veterans. But I, I'd like to ask uh, the panel to, ad to address what may be somewhat a, a, a uh, genuine basis for distinction between service people and uh, non-service people with respect to the application of the Constitution. Slide here, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can all read it to yourselves. This is based uh, on language in the Solario versus United States case, and it had to do with military jurisdiction over uh, over uh, crimes, and and this gives you a a, a flavor at least for how uh, the Constitution basically created in Congress this power to to differentiate between. Uh, members of the military and civilians. And really the foundation for that is the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I'm, my angle on, on this in the next couple of slides is, is pretty heavy on the military justice system. There's a lot more to the differences between military and civilians than just that. But I, uh, my uh, job in the Army National Guard in California is military judge, so it's what I'm most familiar with. But why is there a separate military justice system? Well, these are the reasons I think we can all agree that the military has unique disciplinary needs. And there are some, some far-flung duty stations throughout the world. And uh, when, when soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines misbehave, there needs to be a system that can function in that sort of environment. And th the other thing is, the emphasis on the uniform code of military justice is obvious. Uh, no matter where you go, whether it's, uh, it's Naples, Italy, or Yakuska, Japan, uh, or uh, San Diego, you've got to have the same system applying uh, not only in those jurisdictions, but also uh, among the different branches of the military. So it's, it's quite an impressive system in my view, and it's uh, uh, it, it does have uh, a lot of interesting facets to it. One of the things is it's, it is our country's oldest form of federal jurisprudence. It, it existed, the Articles of War uh, existed before the Constitution. So, uh, and then just some basic things to, to keep in mind in terms of constitutional rights that military members have. Uh, I, I think that my experience was military members do have First Amendment rights, uh, but they are subject to limits. And I, I printed out uh, one example, Article 88, uh, contemptuous words. This is only applies to commissioned officers, but any officer who uses contemptuous words against the president, the vice president, Congress, the secretary of defense, the secretary of a military department, and on it goes. Uh, and the elements of that is those certain words uh, have, have to be uh, contemptuous either by themselves or by virtue of the circumstances under which they were used. Now, I don't know of anyone who was ever prosecuted for violating this particular article. I suspect if someone was uh, accused of violating this, it would be handled at what we call, what we call the military non-judicial punishment. I don't think it would go to a full-blown court-martial unless the accused officer uh, exercised his or her right to go to a court-martial, which is one of the things you can do if you're facing 
non-judicial punishment. So I think under that circumstance, uh, you could say that First Amendment rights are impacted. Uh, there's a, a other basic crimes in the military, such as willful disobedience of orders that are crimes that might implicate one's First Amendment rights. Uh, there's also a disrespect, uttering disrespectful words to a, uh, to a commission officer or superior. Uh, those are also prosecuted and, and uh, as crimes in, in the military, and I have seen those, those prosecuted as well. Uh, there's uh, one final one I'll touch on is uh, Article 117 of the UCMJ, provoking speeches or gestures. And uh, the words or gestures used have to be provoking or reproachful. So uh, I think uh, you could probably uh, fight that one in court and uh, in terms of military members who I have found uh, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, Judge Wingate found, uh, military members are uh, very, they hold the government to its burden. It's, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, just like it is in civilian courts. And if military members do not think the government has proved its case, they will acquit. And uh, so, uh, in any event, I wanted to throw that in there. Uh, but you see the other uh, Fourth Amendment rights are, are listed there. There's been, there's a, a, a the, the military uh, publications and military uh, law reporters are full of Fourth Amendment cases, a lot of them where the Fourth Amendment rights have been up, upheld where you think they wouldn't be, such as a search of a government, uh, a government computer that someone is using to transmit emails or, uh, or other things they shouldn't be. And, uh, and Fourth Amendment rights have been upheld in those circumstances. Fifth Amendment rights are codified in what's called Article 31 rights. Uh, if someone is suspected of committing a crime, and there's an official uh, questioning that occurs, uh, then that person is entitled, that service member is entitled to be read their Article 31 rights, just like uh, in Miranda situations. Uh, so anyway, I've listed these other ones, and, and uh, just uh, all courts martial, uh, whether it's trial level, intermediate appellate level, or the court of the, the uh, Armed Forces uh, Court of Military Appeals, uh, they all look to the Supreme Court as binding precedent. So there are uh, a, a, a number of protections that do apply to the military, but they do have limits. And I, I hope that addresses uh, what, what the topic. Any, other, any comment on that, Judge Wingate? No. Well, the military is a specialized society. And because of its special mission, the, um, the ordinary rights of the citizenry are circumscribed. Its mission is to protect, go to war. Its mission is to order men and women to uh, charge up a hill in the face of possible death. So then the charging party has to have the respect of the troops in order to execute on that order. The, uh, the military has to protect and therefore cannot tolerate seditious the seditious behavior from those in his embrace. So what it all means is that there are a number of articles which address reprehensible conduct as viewed by the military, but those articles are not specifically delineated. There's no bright line which says this is a violation here. It depends upon the circumstances, which means then that those in the military have to be awfully careful about what is said, what is done, so as not to cross a line, because their rights in the military are not the same rights that they have in civilian society because of the military's special mission. Now, I just want to ask one general question. How many of you are familiar with the judicial system in the military? Okay. Then we talk about non-judicial punishment. So then we know that's a captain's mass and the captain makes a decision and the punishment is limited. Summary court martial, which also is limited. It's a hearing officer there who does not have to be a lawyer, et cetera. Special court martial, where the maximum punishment imprisonment is six months and a bad conduct discharge. 
and then general court martial, where the maximum is a bad conduct discharge and time in the um, big house. Now, then there's the administrative side, that one can be processed for administrative discharge and receive an undesirable discharge. An undesirable discharge, which affects one's rights after one has left the military because of the type of discharge that it is. One can be processed out and also be granted an honorable discharge, except or general discharge. So those are the gradations. Now, if someone is deemed to have violated one of the articles that he's talking here, talking about, that person can be referred to a court martial, one of the, any one of the four we talked about, or referred for administrative uh, recompense with regard to all of that. So that person would stand in jeopardy of judicial punishment as well as administrative punishment, can be processed out of the service and lose all benefits, could be uh, processed and lose all rank. So this whole matter of free speech and the boundaries of that speech are very important because someone might end up before a judicial tribunal or end up before an administrative panel. So it's very important that the person understands the peril of loose talk in the military. You know, w w one of the interesting things I, that I found uh, is the, when you uh, compare the, the rights of, of, of a person, of a member of the military while they're in the military, to the rights of, of that same person when they become a veteran, and you compare the veteran's rights to the rights of other citizens of our country, how different they are. And, and, and that's a topic that I would, I, I would like to talk about tomorrow a little bit, but uh, maybe as we wrap, wrap, wrap up here, I'll, I'll say a few words and see if, see if either of the other panelists, uh, what they think about it. One is, a veteran does not have the right to pay a lawyer to represent him. If it used to be uh, a, a punishable by five years in prison and a fine. So whereas in our country, every criminal gets counsel at, at, at government expense if they can't afford one, a veteran cannot pay a lawyer anything to represent him or her. That's number one. Number two, there's, until two, the year 2000, there was never any judicial review of VA decisions. And now there's only very limited judicial review of, of VA decisions. Uh, the third and final differentiation that I'll mention today is the Ferris Doctrine. And the Ferris Doctrine has been he heavily criticized, but the, basically the Ferris Doctrine is a Supreme Court case from 1951, I believe, that says that the Federal Tort Claims Act waiver of sovereign immunity only applies to civilians, and that if the government commits torts on a, on a, on a, on a soldier, the, 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 there's no waiver of sovereign immunity. The government continues to be immune. And it doesn't say that in the statute. And it has been heavily criticized in, in a series of decisions, and I, if anybody's interested, they should look at the Costco, Costco case in the Ninth Circuit, a Judge Ferguson dissent. But notwithstanding that fact, that, that has been the law of the land for 60 years. And so the only group that cannot sue under the Federal Tort Claims Act are, are, are military. And I just think it, 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 it's a distinction that it was wholly contrived, created by the Supreme Court out of whole cloth, no, no statutory exception in the Federal Tort Claims Act, Act itself. And, and it's one of the weakest opinions I've ever seen. But, to, but what, what do you think about this? I mean, do you think m m the military personnel, when they, after they leave the military and they re return to civilian life, are discriminated against. I mean, is this, is this a civil rights issue for veterans? And why, why hasn't this got more attention? Sure. I mean, I know that, that a lot of activity right now uh, is focused on the, the sort of Byzantine labyrinth process of appealing 
adverse decisions on obtaining veterans' benefits. And I know that General Shinoseki is doing his part to, to try and alleviate that situation. I, I think there's probably more pe people in the audience who have a better handle on this than I do, but I know that uh, I, I, a recent Army uh, Reserve JAG on-site uh, conference went over the opportunities that, that uh, specifically Army Reservists have to get mobilized to assist veterans in that process, basically as legal assistance attorneys and help them out through that process. There's probably not nearly enough of them to go around, but it's at least it's, it's something. And I, I know this is going to be covered tomorrow, and I wish I could be here tomorrow. The speakers who are going to be presenting tomorrow are very impressive. But the, if there was ever a ripe area for some sort of, of pro bono work or, or law students during the summers, uh, it, there's probably not a whole lot of pay involved, but if they want to do some good for veterans facing these adverse decisions, I'm sure they could use the help uh, because there's, there's a lot of need there for that. For that. And I don't know if, if you call that discrimination or just call it a, a, a system that's in need of, of repair uh, to, to help, help out these veterans, but it's, it's not a great situation. Just um, a short comment. I have optimism because of my long years. You see, I can remember when ROTSs were kicked off of college campuses. I can recall where um, uniformed men and women were chastised and spat upon, basically, for being involved in Vietnam. I can recall all the heavy-duty arguments as to whether we should be there. I recall so much of those uh, nasty circumstances and nasty times that now when I see um, veterans giving preface and getting on airplanes, when I see uh, veterans being recognized when they walk into establishments and being served free, it's a whole lot different than it was. I like to hope that this same wave of gratitude will continue so that these veterans will reach the uh, financial and recognition goals to which they're so dearly entitled. Well said. Well, I, I think we, at this point, we should maybe wrap up. The, uh, do we, we would want to entertain any questions, or we just want to wrap up? Uh, does anybody have a burning question they want to ask? <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have privately afterwards. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to thank um, Gordon Erspemer. I want to thank Judge McFetridge and Judge Wingate. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and experience with us. <laughs> I want to thank again our sponsors and community partners. Um, I want to thank the students that I've been working with over the last year who have inspired me and have really been wonderful teachers uh, on veterans-related issues for me. I want to thank my graceful and unflappable staff, Lisa Lamba, Maggie Stone, and Matteo Jenkins, without whose wonderful work none of this would have happened. <clears throat> and I want to thank Golden Gate Law student Sarah Yohe Quinta and our veteran student ambassadors for their important contributions tonight. I hope that each of us find ways to continue to organize the legal community, law students, and veterans advocates to help build and support the broad-based coalition needed to address the justice gaps veterans face. Please join us for a reception out in the lobby here. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>